Thank you, Henry and Heine. I'm, I'm honored to uh, uh, be designated the faculty research lecturer, but really, I think this is a, a recognition of the contributions of the graduate students and postdoctoral fellows and research team over the years in the laboratory because they're the people that really did the work. And what the work is that we've studied, as Henry alluded to, is aspects of virus-host interaction. And uh, the main focus had been, has been on an antiviral uh, substance, uh, interferon, that it inhibits virus replication, as I will share with you. Um, interferon's an approved therapeutic, uh, has been used for the treatment of, of uh, hepatitis B, uh, most widely uh, until the vaccine was developed, and then hepatitis C uh, until the chemotherapeutics were developed. But I think beyond uh, interferon as an antiviral, it, uh, simply the study of the interferon system has provided unique insights into pathways and regulatory systems that are operative in, in mammalian cells in the virus host interaction. You know, if we were in the biology lecture hall, I'd know how to dim the lights, but I'm not sure I know how to achieve that here, if I could get some help to dim the lights on the screen. Uh, you know, viruses as pathogens, as, as you're aware, are it can be of significance, both to the human and, and in veterinary medicine. And RNA viruses in particularly, particular are continuing to evolve and uh, new strains emerge that cause uh, epidemics and in some instances uh, pandemics, uh, which are worldwide epidemics. So it's, it's increasingly important to have strategies to prevent and, and treat infections. Now, there have been some successes in the past. Uh, smallpox declared or eradicated in 1980, and polio nearing eradication. So on the other hand, though, there are a number of challenges that remain, uh, illustrated by influenza. In 1918, the swine flu pandemic was responsible for an estimated 20 to 40 million deaths. That's more than died in combat in that year of World War I. And that's what got people's attention in 2009 when an H1N1 virus emerged in Southern California. Very astute physicians picked up on that early, but still spread globally as a pandemic, but the virus was not nearly as virulent, thank goodness, as the 1918 virus. And then there are various avian viruses that, while not readily transmitted to the human, uh, do have a high mortality, 40 to 60 percent. And then of coronaviruses and respiratory infections, SARS and MERS that emerged uh, in the last few years. And Ebola uh, in 2014, where in some areas in Africa, the mortality was 50 percent or greater. And then there are a class of viruses, the flaviviruses, West Nile virus that first appeared in North America and Long Island in 1999, a flaviovirus. And then Zika, uh, while the virus uh, had been known since the late 1940s, a couple of years in South America emerged as a, as a challenge. And then we have measles that, uh, in spite of a very effective vaccine, still more than 100,000 deaths annually from measles infections. So what are the strategies that are in place to prevent uh, and treat viral diseases? One strategy uh, involves uh, vaccines, uh, adaptive immunity. And in this case, you know, the concept of immunization goes back to Jenner in the 18th century in smallpox, when he had recognized that milkmaidens rarely contract smallpox because they'd been infected with cowpox to provide uh, 
uh, uh, uh, protection. And so that's the beginning of immunizations. Vaccines work, but they need to be utilized. And with smallpox, it's been eradicated, nearing eradication with polio. But a vaccine is typically very, very virus type specific. And it takes time to build the immunity. So there's a delayed response, independent of the approach. But you know, currently, the latest approach is a recombinant approach, a subunit vaccine, as il illustrated by Gardasil. So vaccines are important in prevention. But there are still challenges. And the challenge is, you have a vaccine, you need to use it. And in spite of the existence of a very effective live attenuated vaccine for measles, as I said, there's still 100,000 deaths annually worldwide, mostly in children that have not been immunized. And indeed, in California, there was a recent epidemic, the so-called Disneyland outbreak in December of 2014. And it was predominantly uh, individuals that had not been immunized that were involved in that. And that led to a change in law in California, the so-called vaccine mandate that was put in place in 2016. So the second strategy, though, aside from innate, uh, aside from vaccines and adaptive immunity, is one of chemotherapeutics. And there's been some successes here where there are no vaccines that exist for the virus. And examples would be HIV as the causative agent of AIDS and hepatitis C, HCV, uh, that can lead to liver cancer. But the challenge is one of selectivity uh, of the drug against the viral function and the potential for resistance. And typically, the therapy that's been used is a combination therapy. With HIV, for example, an immense amount of knowledge has been gained about the replication of the virus and the virus gene products that are, that are involved. And the first, the uh, polymerase, uh, uh, reverse transcriptase, a special type of polymerase, was a target of a number of drugs. And then the second target was, was a virus-coded uh, protease, which is a type of enzyme that cleaves proteins, the polyprotein, into the mature viral proteins. And then combinations of drugs against the polymerase and protease were used. And with HIV, what happens is, is a so-called provirus, a DNA copy of the virus, gets made and inserted into the genome of the host cell. And that is caused by a viral enzyme called the integrase. And that enzyme has been targeted. And then most recently, the targets involve um, glycoprotein components of the virus particle and the early stage, the entry stage, either by interaction with the receptor or the fusogenic property of the virus. But here, there are a number of drugs that have been developed, and there is no vaccine, that have been used to treat HIV, and, and the drug treatment leads to an inhibition of virus production. Similarly, for hepatitis C, there's a new combination therapy. Interferon had been the treatment for hepatitis C, but there's a new combination therapy where two different drugs target different viral functions that are involved in replication of the RNA. One of the viral proteins is the, uh, the polymerase, the enzyme that copies the RNA, and another a, a particular protein that's also required for the RNA replication. And so when RNA replication is inhibited, then you uh, inhibit the production of the virus. So these chemotherapeutic approaches of are valuable, and uh, especially in cases like HCV where there's no vaccine. Um, and, and in this case, uh, it work uh, a little more broadly than interferon therapy had. And then the third strategy, though, and, and the system that we've studied quite intensely uh, for several years is the interferon response, the cytokine response which is now known as an innate immune response. And in this case, the antiviral state that's generated in the inhibition of the virus occurs in a virus-type, nonspecific manner. That is, interferon works against a wide range of viruses. And it's a very rapid response, as opposed to an adaptive immune response that takes time to mature. So the interferon response can be uh, important um, 
In, in the case of emerging viruses where there's no vaccine and no chemotherapeutic, and in, in, in our, uh, natural infections, when we're infected, it's actually the interferon response that's our first line of defense to deal with the infection. It's not perfect, though, uh, in that viruses have evolved uh, mechanisms to antagonize the interferon response, so you have ranges of the sensitivity. So, you know, how did we get interferon? Interferon was discovered by uh, Isaacs and Lindemann when they were studying virus interference years ago. And this is uh, Jean Lindemann at a symposium, I think you can see the year, 2007 in Freiburg. Uh, what they were studying was interference, and what they discovered is that when a cell was infected with a virus, there was a soluble substance produced that could be separated from the virus, and when that soluble substance was used to treat cells, an antiviral state was generated whereby virus replication was inhibited. And uh, importantly, that inhibition was uh, uh, displayed not only against the virus that induced the substance, but also other viruses. It was heterologous. And, and this substance, the soluble substance, was coined interferon because of the ability to interfere with virus replication. And this is the first cytokine discovered. So the question that we've been interested in for many years is how does interferon work to inhibit virus replication? And so there's been an immense amount of knowledge gained about interferon action that is how interferon signals in cells to change the gene expression profile to give rise to that state where virus replication is inhibited. And there are in the order of about 100 genes whose expression is altered. But there are a few that are especially important for the antiviral activity, and we'll discuss them. The other aspect relates to the mechanism by which viral infection induces the expression of interferon. Interferon normally is not expressed. It's induced by infection. And it, it's not a single substance. It's a multi-gene family. That is, there are multiple interferons produced that signal through cognate receptors to create the antiviral state. And what we had found in, in others is the sensing of foreign nucleic acid, the sensing of double-stranded RNA is in the, is a key trigger in both the induction and the action of interferon. And the perception initially was that it was foreign double-stranded RNA, but it's not limited to the pathogen double-stranded RNA self, cellular RNA, uh, duplex RNA will mediate the same effects. So the first virus that we analyzed was uh, a virus VSV, in that it was the virus used to uh, assay interferon. It's a bullet-shaped envelope virus, a pretty simple virus. It has five genes, and the gene, genome, the gene, genes are RNA, uh, uh, minus strand RNA for this virus. So uh, by plaque reduction, and with the light you probably wouldn't see this, but uh, this is what was called a plaque reduction assay, and, and each of these cultures were infected with the same amount of virus, but as the dose of interferon was increased, the plaque, which is a zone of infection, was reduced in size to the point that you didn't see a plaque, because the rate of multiplication was inhibited. And then when interferon was cloned, and we had access to the pure material pretty early on, this illustrates the single cycle activity of the first alpha interferon, alpha A. And interferon reduced the infectious yield of virus about three logs or more. That's a substantial antiviral effect when you consider that in the VSV infected cell, one particle is sufficient to initiate an infection, but the yield out of that cell is in the order of 1,000 to 5,000 infectious particles, and you're reducing the yield 
three logs. It's a substantial antiviral effect. So then the next question was how did interferon cause the inhibition of virus multiplication? Did interferon affect early steps, the ability of the virus to get into the cell? Or this virus, like many RNA viruses, carries its own enzyme that copies the, the RNA or generates the messenger RNA, which is the form of nucleic acid that is translated to make the proteins that you need to make new viruses. And so by analyzing the various steps, what we found was that protein synthesis was the key step that was inhibited. That is, the translation of the message into viral protein. And that was illustrated, for example, in, in this sort of experiment where cells are post-labeled with a precursor to the protein, a radioactive amino acid. And in infected cells that had not been treated with interferon, the major proteins that are produced are the five viral proteins. The virus has five messages and makes five proteins. Cellular protein synthesis is shut off by the virus. But as you treated the cells with a saturating concentration of interferon for increasing times, the production of viral protein synthesis is reduced and cellular protein synthesis is recovered. So translation is the block which leads to the inhibition of production of infectious virus. We uh, were also studying a different virus, and sometimes you need to be lucky. Uh, we were lucky in, uh, in that the virus that we were studying for completely other reasons, uh, translational control types of questions, real virus has a double-stranded RNA genome. So the genes of this virus are double-stranded RNA. It's the discovery of naturally occurring double-stranded RNA. And there are uh, 10 segments uh, uh, of fairly large pieces. So with real virus, again, it was protein synthesis that was inhibited to inhibit the yield of virus. So in terms of how animal, there are many animal viruses in the Nature of the genetic information depends on the virus. Some viruses, many viruses have as their genetic information DNA, double-stranded DNA, as our, is our genes, double-stranded DNA. But some of those viruses use cellular machinery to duplicate the DNA and to express it, uh, whereas other DNA viruses make their own polymerases that are necessary to duplicate and, and express the genome. On the other hand, uh, there are a large number of RNA viruses uh, where the gene genome of the virus is RNA, and it can be either of the polarity, as we call it, that's equivalent to messenger RNA that's expressed to make protein. Those are positive strand viruses. Or it can be of opposite polarity, uh, such as measles or VSV or flu, and we call those negative strand viruses. And then uh, viruses like real virus that had double have a double-stranded RNA genome. So the point is that there are many ways to copy the nucleic acid and express it at the RNA level. But once that's achieved in, in an infected cell, once you make the messenger RNA, it's completely cellular in terms of the expression of that message to make protein. It's the cell's machinery. All right, so then, what's the nature of the genes that are induced by interferon that's responsible for the inhibition of virus multiplication through inhibition of viral protein synthesis? So we were able to purify the induced inhibitor and ultimately characterize it and what a key inhibitor is, a cornerstone of the responses, turns out to be a protein kinase. It's a protein kinase that's now known as PKR because the kinase is regulated by RNA, is where the R comes from. So how the system works is the interferon treatment causes the induction of the gene to make the PKR protein. But that protein in the interferon-treated cell is not active. It's activated by infection. And the, the 
effective response, whether it be with VSV or real virus or measles, produces a RNA and the activation is RNA dependent. So what happens is the kinase phosphorylates itself. It autophosphorylates and at a particular residue, a key one happens to be a threonine, 446. And when PKR is phosphorylated, it's active and then can phosphorylate a substrate, and that substrate happens to be a factor that you need to initiate translation, to initiate the process of making protein. And when that factor EIF2 alpha is phosphorylated on a serine, serine 51, that leads to an inhibition of translation. So this is a key mechanism in terms of how interferon inhibits viral replication by activating the kinase that inhibits the factor to lead to an inhibition of translation. So we cloned and isolated the human cDNA and then the mouse and characterized the proteins quite extensively. And one of the first questions that we were interested in answering is how does the RNA activate the kinase? And what we identified is a particular region in the N-terminus part of the protein that was the RNA binding domain. It was a new type of domain that bound double-stranded RNA and it's actually repeated. And so that domain is bound by uh, uh, double-stranded RNA in a structure-dependent manner, but there's no sequence specificity. It's simply double-stranded structure. A synthetic RNA, poly-IC, or a naturally occurring RNA like real virus genome is bound, mediates dimerization of the kinase autophosphorylation and phosphorylation of the IF2. On the bottom is an illustration of the activation in the presence of a double-stranded RNA or, or without RNA of the purified protein. But in a natural infection, there's very little free double-stranded RNA in the cell, probably none. It's shielded by protein. And what the true activator is is secondary structure, duplex structure in a single-stranded RNA. And real virus S1 RNA was, was the first uh, 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 message characterized as an activator. Uh, S4 RNA does not activate, as shown here, uh, a type of a measles RNA called DIRNA, we recently showed activated. And then you can screen and isolate uh, synthetic RNAs by select approaches that was done with Tom Check's group uh, and purely synthetic RNAs, but with duplex structure will activate or antagonize, which brings me to the point that adenovirus is a type of virus that's very resistant to interferon. And the reason that it's resistant is that the virus generates a viral RNA called VARNA. It's a product of a particular kind of, of polymerase, Pol3. And the VARNA binds and antagonizes the activation of PKR. So it blocks the activation of PKR, the first known antagonist. And now there are a number of viral gene products that are known that antagonize this kinase. Well, it turns out that the phosphorylation of serine 51 to modulate translation is not limited to the virus-host interaction and interferon. It's a universal mechanism of translational control in a variety of conditions. And we now know that there are five different protein kinases that phosphorylate the same serine 51. PKR is known as EIF2 alpha kinase 2. So what we identified and characterized and worked out is actually the second one. Irving London's group at uh, MIT uh, isolated the first, which is known as HRI. And this is in red blood cells. In heman deficiency, you have an inhibition of protein synthesis. No heman, you don't need to make globin because you can't make hemoglobin. And so in heman deficiency, H, uh, a kinase is activated, known as HRI, heman-regulated inhibitor, that phosphorylates serine 51. 
Early on, we exchanged enzymes, and we showed you could not distinguish the phosphopeptide phosphorylated with their enzyme or ours. And then later, we could show that it was serine 51. Then somewhat later, PERC was identified by Ron Wexlab. So PERC is another EIF2 alpha kinase, PKR-like endoplasmic reticulum kinase. So PERC is activated under conditions of ER stress, unfolded protein response. And then Alan Hennenbush's uh, group at NIH in yeast showed that GCN2 is an EIF2 kinase that's phosphorylated under conditions of amino acid starvation as the stress in yeast. And then most recently, a PKZ has been described. So it's like PKR, but it's a ZDNA binding repeat structure rather than the double-stranded RNA. And uh, the proposal is that EIF2 is the target. So universal mechanism, a variety of stress signals mediate the activation of this pathway, leading to inactivation of the initiation factor. We're concerned with PKR, though, in, in the interferon response. So PKR plays important roles as an antiviral component, and it's pro-apoptotic, so leads to the cell death, apoptosis of the cell. And a variety of lines of evidence uh, led to those conclusions, including overexpression of wild type or mutant forms of the, of the kinase, uh, disruption of the mouse gene. Um, some viruses have cell tropism. Uh, for example, can only infect a human cell, and we were able to generate human cell lines stably deficient in the kinase. And then the existence of a number of viral antagonists further illustrates the importance of PKR, where the virus has evolved to block that enzyme. Pox VA was the first RNA antagonist. Pox viruses make a potent double-stranded RNA protein that, that uh, sequesters the double-stranded RNA. And they also express a protein that acts as a pseudo-substrate to interfere with the process. So our studies on PKR then led us to uh, ADAR. ADAR is an adenosine deaminase acting on RNA. Uh, ADAR came out of our genetic screen when we were screening to isolate the clone of, of PKR. And the clone KD8 was studied in the lab simply because it recognized the interferon-inducible transcript that was huge, about 7 kb. And then we had identified three copies of the RNA binding motif that we'd characterized in PKR. And that's the only reason the ADAR clone was studied, but it was a good move. We ultimately were able to show that uh, KD8, the cloning was not trivial. It's about a 7 kb cDNA. That's about the size of a small virus genome. What this ADAR is, is, is an interferon-inducible enzyme, as is PKR. Uh, but catalyzes the deamination of adenosine in double-stranded RNA. So both ADAR1, uh, what we had isolated is now known as ADAR1, which is a clue there's going to be a second one. ADAR1 and PKR are important in the action of interferon, but also in the induction side of, of the interferon system. So what does ADAR do? So what ADAR does is catalyze a C6 deamination of adenosine in double-stranded RNA to produce inosine. And so this is important uh, because it can result in altered coding if it's in a, in a region of the RNA that's an open reading frame, or minimally altered structure. And the altered structure is going to be key here. But this happens because the inosine that's generated, I, base pairs as if it's a G, not an A. And so this, in an open reading frame, can give a different codon and a different amino acid, or simply in structure, generates an IU mismatch. And if you have enough of these mismatches, you destabilize the structure of the nucleic acid. So um, it was a bit of a challenge, because there are two size forms of the 8R1 product an interferon-inducible protein that's about 150, P150, 
and that protein's found in both the cytoplasm and the nucleus of the cell. And then there's a constitutively expressed P110 protein that's nuclear. Two types of RNA binding motifs, the double-stranded RNA uh, domain that's repeated, uh, three copies, and R3 is crucial for any substrate deamination. Point mutations of this domain kills activity. The N-terminus we had described as a pox virus homology, and then Alex Rich uh, at MIT had studied DNA structure and, and Z DNA domains, um, but had no protein. And then Affinity purified a protein, and it turned out uh, we'd reported the sequence of ADAR, and I got a telephone call, it was ADAR. So that's the discovery of the Z DNA binding motif, and the physiologic significance is still a little bit elusive. Both P110 and P150 are active deaminases. Now, how do you express them? Well, the gene is driven by multiple promoters, three promoters, and alternative exon 1 um, uh, splicing, and also exon 7 goes with the exon 1. So there are, there, there are th three different ways of driving the expression of the gene, but only one of those promoters is responsive to interferon, and that's the so-called P150 promoter that gives uh, the inducible protein that's in the cytoplasm. The knockout, so the disruption of the gene in the mouse, deletion of the gene in the mouse, results in embryonic lethality. So this was first done by Peter Seberg and Heidelberg and Kazuku Nishikura at Wistar, and they viscerated the gene. They took out both P110 and P150. The surprise was that when we disrupted in a selective way, so we disrupted only the expression of P150, P110 was normal in work with Mike Oldstone at Scripps. And that was embryonic lethal as the total disruption. And that was a surprise because usually in the interferon system, if you delete a gene, as long as you keep the animals disease free and away from pathogens, they'll do fine. But this didn't. And the characteristic was pronounced apoptosis of the hemopoietic stem cell lineage in the absence of ADAR. So what's ADAR modifying? So the first substrate was identified by neuroscientists, and it is a receptor for a neurotransmitter, glutamate, and they had shown that in two different exons, which are regions of the RNA that get expressed to make protein, there is amino acid substitution that occurs because an A becomes a G, like editine. And in uh, the case of both uh, the RG site, because it's an arginine that becomes a glycine, that specific change was driven by an inverted complementary sequence between the exon and intron, and conceptually the same for the QR site. <clears throat> well, we showed that we could edit the RG site by 8R1, but we couldn't touch the QR site although we uh, did heavily edit a hot spot in the intron. Uh, the significance of that still is unclear. So this then led a number of labs to go for the other activity that's known as ADAR2 that edits the QR site. Then the next substrate turned out to be, again, a pre-mRNA for a different neurotransmitter uh, receptor, serotonin, the 2C receptor. And it was conceptually the same of an inverted complementary sequence. Dependent upon the species, there are five or six sites that get edited that give rise to three amino acid substitutions. And as we showed with Ron Emerson's group that discovered this at Vanderbilt, both 8R1 and 8R2 are necessary to fully edit. And that changes the G protein coupling of the receptor. And then there are a couple of other specific editings that were identified by labs. Uh, other labs, but then it kind of hit the wall. No other substrates. Measles, though, uh, had been described hypermutations of A to I or A to G, and also polyoma. Polyoma is a DNA virus, 
and the RNAs get made off of opposite strands and they overlap to make double-strandedness that gets edited. Well, what we've shown uh, most recently is that naturally occurring double-stranded RNAs, which are generated by the virus, and I'll show you what happens with measles, but also the cell, remarkably cellular RNA. There are a number of cellular RNAs that have sufficient duplex structure to trigger some of these responses, and ADAR is suppressing that. So what got us to that point? Well, a disease, it's rare with measles, called SSPE, subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. This is when measles goes persistent in the CNS, central nervous system. It's very rare and almost always fatal. And when uh, autopsy material was characterized by the group at Zurich and Würzburg, what was found was the viral sequences were uh, heavily mutated of A to G substitutions as if it was edited. So that's why we looked at measles. And so measles, the, the, the molecular virology is very similar to VSV. Uh, it's a negative sense virus, uh, uh, multiplies in the cytoplasm of the cell. Uh, a couple of more genes than VSV. Measles has two glycoproteins to make the envelope. But measles also has uh, two additional proteins that, that were called C and V that were known to be pathogenic factors and C had been described as affecting the interferon response. So Roberto Contagnano's group pioneered what's called the reverse genetic system of measles. It's a negative sense RNA virus, but it allows you to make mutations. And so we have mutants that are, are isogenic with wild type where either the expression of C was destroyed without affecting the expression of P that you need to make new virus in the multiplication, and likewise, a mutation that knocks out the expression of V. So we could assess the role of the C protein, the V protein against wild type virus. And what we found is that the wild type and the V mutant viruses both replicate very efficiently into high yields in cells that make PKR and ADAR. But the C mutant does not. The growth of the C mutant is reduced, restricted by uh, typically in the order of a couple of logs, a hundredfold or so. But you could substantially rescue the growth of the mutant by getting rid of PKR. If you'd, if you'd generate a human cell line that was deficient in PKR, then that, that mutant would multiply. But uh, in the case of ADAR, ADAR deficient cells, you didn't rescue a growth, quite the opposite happened virus replicated less efficiently, including the wild type and V mutant. So the effects of PKR and ADAR, even though they're both interferon inducible, are just opposite in terms of the biology. So what's going on is that ADAR is suppressing the activation of PKR. It suppresses the virus-induced cytotoxic effects, apoptosis, and as a result, enhances virus growth. Much had, uh, had been seen with HDV early on, which should have been a clue where a stop codon is converted to a tryptophan to allow the virus to grow. So at any rate, uh, various strategies, including overexpression of the mutant and wild-type forms of ADAR, analysis of cells that are deficient in ADAR, and disruption of the mouse genes have, have led to the conclusions with regard to the biochemistry. So ADAR is generally proviral and anti-apoptotic. What about interferon production? So, so in terms of the signaling pathways, the left-hand side of the initial slide that I showed you, an immense knowledge has been gained in terms of how cells sense infection to produce interferon. And for many viruses, most RNA viruses, it's by a pathway pioneered by uh, Fujita and Akira in Japan, where they identified the cytosolic sensor, which are card helicases, known as rig-like receptors, the rig-like pathway. And there are two of them, rig-I and MDA5. And so these 
molecules sense the double-stranded RNA or the duplex structure made by the virus and then signal through an adapter uh, that uh, we call IPS1, but a number of labs have studied that protein and it goes by various names, to activate the key transcription factors, ERF3 and, and alpha-capta B, that drive the expression of the interferon. So, so in response to measles, it's, a, it's the IPS-dependent pathway that gives rise to production of interferon. So the C mutant is a potent activator and an impotent inducer in terms of the production of, of beta interferon relative to the wild type in the V uh, uh, mutant. And that response is typically amplified by uh, PKR. It's a translational amplification by prevention of in the resynthesis of the inhibitor I kappa B of NF kappa B. How about in ADAR deficient cells? Well, the wild type and V mutant viruses become as potent of inducers as the C mutant in the absence of ADAR. So in the absence of ADAR, you're removing what's suppressing and great induction. So they, again, the effects of PKR and ADAR are just opposite at the level of amplification of induction. And so the suppression of the wild type virus interferon induction uh, that's mediated by ADAR uh, requires catalytic activity, does not require ZDNA binding activity um, in mediating those effects. So what is it in the C mutant infected cells that's giving rise to the robust activation of PKR, robust induction of interferon. Well, the C-mutant readily produces double, a double-stranded RNA that you don't detect with wild type or V-mutant cells. The quantitation's on the right. But the point is, the mutant makes more double-stranded RNA. And the question then, what is the double-stranded RNA? Well, after a lot of effort, what was found is that in the absence of the C protein, the polymerase then copies back and makes what are known as DI, defective interfering RNAs. A type of RNA that had been described years ago by Marcus and VSV and Baltimore and Wong and VSV as being important in the recovery of a VSV infection in the mouse model. So we identified a whole class of these DIRNAs that have a stem of about 100 base pairs, but varying loop sizes because in terms of how the breakpoint occurs by the polymerase, it's variable, but the reinitiation site is pretty, pretty uh, narrow. And so the C mutant makes about an order of magnitude tenfold greater concentration of these RNAs <coughs> than does the wild type virus. But in the presence of ADAR, there are A to G changes in that stem. And if you characterize uh, in the absence of ADAR and with wild type, it's pretty much perfect duplex. But in the presence of ADAR, variable degree of, of uh, editing dependent upon the isolate from 10% or less of the potential sites on up to approaching nearly half of the theoretical sites get edited which would destabilize the structure and impair activation of PKR and induction of interferon. So that seems to be what's going on. So uh, shifting back a bit, one of the hallmarks of infection that's seen uh, often with RNA viruses are these RNA granules that form in the cytoplasm of the cell. It's called sometimes stress granules, and they're aggregates of stalled translation initiation complexes, RNA binding proteins that have been characterized by others. And so uh, first with hepatitis C virus and work uh, mainly by uh, Bartenschlager's group, but it was a collaboration, HCV generates the formation of stress granules and it's PKR dependent. 
And then we showed with measles, it's a similar thing, a PKR-dependent generation, but you need PKR to inhibit the protein synthesis, which would stall these systems. So that made sense. It, the C-mutant was a potent inducer, but in the absence of ADAR, wild type becomes a, a potent inducer, as it did um, uh, for the production of interferon. And then what was originally in a control as part of another experiment that was discovered by Ligio in the lab, that in the absence of ADAR, if you simply treat a cell with interferon, you'll trigger the formation of these stress granules. And so we shifted then from the human system back to our murine system where we had the genetic knockouts of ADAR1 and 2. And ADAR1 deficient uh, MAFs, uh, mouse embryo fibroblasts, show a robust stress granule response, but eight or two deficient cells are like wild type. So then it became a question of what is interferon doing in terms of the genetic recoding, if you will, the editing of the nucleic acid. And so a number of groups have taken pretty high-powered sequencing approaches to try to identify editing sites including uh, Billy Lee's lab at Stanford, whom we collaborated with. And it turns out, um, while the original neuroscience discoveries of glutamate and serotonin receptor transcripts are important, that confused us for a bit. That's the exception of editing to give an amino acid change. Usually, the editing changes structure. And the editing sites are in, typically, untranslated regions, the vast majority. There are a few thousands of these sites. And they're in repeat elements. So another reason for assessing the mouse, in the human that has ALU sequences, these are repeats and they're great targets for ADAR. So in that mouse, then, what was the effect of interferon of editing and what uh, enzyme was responsible? So we analyzed. Uh, over 500 loci in each, and there are multiple editing sites at, at some of these uh, targets. And what's shown is the quantitation from zero to one, uh, or unedited to 100% edited at given sites in uh, RNA from an interferon treated cell versus an untreated cell. So if there's no change, it would be on the diagonal. So you can see the interferon treatment ups the editing at a number of the sites. And that uh, is largely catalyzed by ADAR1, in that if one analyzes ADAR2 null cells, the knockout, it's a pattern more or less similar to wild type. But the ADAR1 knockout, you lose the editing. So the bulk of the editing is by ADAR1, interferon inducible and not. And if one analyzes cells that are deficient in either STAT1 or STAT2 transcription factors, so you don't have the interferon induction, by and large, there's li little induced editing. But the ADAR1 P150 selective knockout looks like the double knockout. Very little editing. So then the approach that we took was computational. If you know the sites of editing, is it possible to identify an inverted complementary sequence, a sequence of RNA that would give the duplex structure in the cellular RNA, because these are cellular, that would allow for the editing. And the answer is yes. And this is the ex one example where searching 200 nucleotides each direction of the editing site, uh, the red symbols are A's that were edited. And so there are a number in this particular substrate, there are 11, and all are on what would be one strand, and they're pretty much uh, in all duplex areas. So there's substantial editing that occurs of the cellular RNA. So in conclusion then, you know, A to I editing is important. It's important because you can generate altered coding, so effectively diversity of protein function, um, as illustrated by the GLUR and serotonin 2C receptors, but altered RNA structure. And so that altered structure, of, you know, in terms of what are the roles of, of genetic recoding by A to I editing? Well, there are a vast number of roles. Uh, 
changes in mRNA translation that we, we've alluded to with GLUR and serotonin and also the hepatitis D stop codon to tryptophan. And the other would be uh, with uh, ADR2 being important, at least for the uh, neurotransmitter receptors, uh, altered RNA structure, which would affect protein binding. And ADR1 seems to be key here with PKR, IR3 activation, and specifically MDA5, the cytosolic sensor. And what's the evidence for that? I'll show you in a second. And then there are a few other isolated effects. ADR2 autoregulates its own expression by editing a key A that's needed in the splicing process. And there are a couple of descriptions where altered microRNA targeting and altered microRNA production are affected by editing. So a range of biology can change as a consequence of that deamination. So in terms of uh, the current thinking, what's believed to be going on is if you have a situation with a virus that produces large amounts of double-stranded RNA, the editing can't keep up with it. The double-stranded RNA triggers, triggers through the rig-like receptors to induce interferon or activates PKR. But if there are low amounts of double-stranded RNA, viral, uh, and uh, in the presence of ADAR, then the structure is destabilized, as I showed you with the DIs, and you do not get a, uh, the triggering of the rig-like receptors, so there's not a good production of interferon, and PKR is not activated, as has been shown by our lab and others. In the absence of infection, there are cellular RNAs that are produced that have sufficient duplex structure, but those RNAs, i.e. self-RNAs, in the presence of ADAR, that structure would be destroyed. Sig signaling is off for interferon, and PKR is not activated. But in the absence of ADAR, cumulatively, they accumulate and can trigger those responses. So that's kind of where we're at. Now, in terms of the development question, back to the knockout, where embryonic lethality is seen at E12 to 13, when you knock out both P110 and P150, or if you selectively knock out P150, or if the knock-in is done with a form of ADAR1 that's the proteins there, but it's not catalytically active. So that was done by Walkley's group. Uh, because it's a good D DSRNA binding protein. All of those are le lethal. But what the Melbourne group just recently has shown is you can rescue the lethality of the mouse by doing a second knockout. And the knockout is MDA5. So that is to say, if you knock out this sensor, in the background to the absence of ADAR, then you rescue. So that's saying that's the sensing of those cumulative structures that's the real key. Furthermore, it's been shown by Yannick Crow's, Crow's group in Paris, the so-called uh, AG syndrome, Macardi Gutierrez syndrome, in humans, where these individuals produce, present with a robust type 1 interferon the mutations that have been identified are in ADAR1 that decrease activity and in MDA5 that activate MDA5. So it seems to extend to the human. All right, so the work that I've described was all carried out down a block here in Bio2 and, and that new building, Henry, LSB, that you alluded to that we're so grateful of, of getting. Uh, and really is the product of a number of graduate students that have earned their degree working on these problems and, and postdoctoral fellows and uh, uh, research staff and uh, George, who uh, research biologist that we've worked together for several years, and productive collaborations with investigators around the world and also here at home in work that I 
didn't have a chance to describe. And the, and the studies have been made possible by funding over a pretty long period of time from the National Institutes of Health. Thank you very much.